right. Um, yeah, this was sent to me. I'm pretty sure it was a Patreon request. But um, Geddy Lee tells his family's Holocaust story. This should be mad. Because we had a um, Holocaust survivor come to our school. And you got to bear in mind, I went to a very, like, working class school. We terrorised every teacher, like. Um, but I even remember being, like, I was probably about 14. And when he, this matey, Rudy Oppenheimer, I think his name was. He came in and talked, and I swear to God, you could, like, you, you take a bunch of teenagers that really, yeah, ain't the best at sitting and paying attention to something, but you couldn't hear a pin, you could have heard a pin drop in that um, auditorium, because, yeah, it was intense. Especially when he actually was the one he what he he's he went through it, like in it's his story, yeah. But yeah, anyway, like I say, it's definitely a um. These Holocaust stories are brutal, but let's go. New York's classic rock, Q one zero four three. Today is UN International Holocaust Remembrance Day, and I am sitting next to someone who you may not know has extreme emotional ties to the Holocaust because both of his parents survived the Holocaust, and the world would not have Getty Lee of Rush had his parents not survived three concentration camps. Um, so first of all, welcome. Hi. Thank you nice for to be here. for telling coming here to tell your parents' story. Sure. Um, so your parents were from Poland. Yeah, my parents were from Poland. My mother was born in Warsaw, and moved to a small town uh, about an Jesus. hour south called Stachowice. And uh, my father was uh, from a town, uh, I don't know how the English version of it, but he called it Ostrovce. But he was from another town, and uh, uh, yeah, they were both in the work camps, and that's where they met. They met in the work camps, uh, I think it was 39. How old were they? Uh, 12 and 13. That wow. Age, yeah. And so they would meet, and you know, they were kids, really, you know. Uh, adolescents, and they would chit chat and flirt on their way to the work camps. Because uh, originally, when uh, when the German army moved in there, they needed to build the camps, right? So they used the uh, young people and the healthy people of the town, the Jewish population, to to walk to the site and and build and work uh, until it was uh, finished. So they did what they had to do. So. Um, that's where they met. And, of course, they would joke around and flirt, as kids would, and no matter what the circumstance. Uh, uh -huh. And they sort of had a crush on each other. They ended up at Auschwitz before yeah. they were separated with Jesus. your mother, Manya, going to Bergen-Belsen and your father taken to Dachau. How old were they then? Do you know when they were separated? Um, well, my mom... Uh, and Dad were in Auschwitz, I think, for a couple of years. Uh, and how they survived in there, I don't know. Um, my dad was transferred out of Auschwitz before my mother was. Uh, my mother and her sister and her mother survived together in Auschwitz. And uh, my grandmother used to tell this story because they would line them up every day. And they would go left, right, left, right, right? If you were... Uh, went to one direction, you went to the gas chambers. If you went to the other direction, you went to work. Jesus. So my grandmother would rearrange them in the lineup so they all went to the same direction because she believed that if they were all going to perish, they would perish together, and if they were all going to survive, they would survive together. But my grandmother was an amazing person. She kept them alive uh, throughout their time in the camps. And uh, and they, when the war was starting to look 
uh, bad for the Germans, and panic ensued, uh, and they were starting to ship uh, surviving prisoners into Germany and out of Poland. That's when the three of them were put in a, a cattle car and shipped to Bergen-Belsen, where they were eventually liberated. There are many Holocaust survivors who just did not want to speak of that horror to their children. Your parents were different. They started speaking about this to you when you were how old? Um, my earliest memories were my mother talking about the war and talking about uh, Hitler and talking about what had happened to her family. You know, uh, My dad was not a big talker about that period, and and he passed away when I was about 12 years old. So, uh, But I remember my mother constantly reinforcing the idea that we had to keep the family together because these terrible things can happen, and she felt, uh, and as many survivors did, that it was their uh, their desire to repopulate and rebuild the clan that had been destroyed by... Uh, by the war. You're listening to Getty Lee. Yes, that Getty Lee of Rush. Both of his parents are Holocaust survivors, and we honor them on this International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Did did they actually, Getty, tell you about, I mean, as a child, about the horrors they endured? Yeah, they did. <laughs> so what did they... I mean, I, mean I could have turned out to be a real mental case, but <laughs> I didn't. Um, my mom was is a a really interesting woman. She's super strong. And so she believed in sharing everything she'd experienced. Now, it gave me nightmares as a child, as I'm sure my brother and sister had the same thing. My my brother was too young to remember a lot of this, but my sister is two years older than me. So we grew up with, uh, you know, the same, you know, horror that, that she had survived. And we felt, you know, blessed that we still had her in our lives, and, and my grandmother and my aunts and uncles, all who were survivors of, of the Holocaust. and So it's a very large community, and they stay very tightly knit, and that was their way of reinforcing uh, the importance to carry on. But uh, some of my uncles and aunts were more closed-mouthed about it, and, and I have friends that, uh, one friend in particular who uh, is you know, one of my closest friends, Ben Mink, a musician who's worked with Rush and had gone on to be successful producing Katie Lang. His parents were Holocaust survivors. And that was one of the things that bonded us was the stories. In, in some sense, we felt like we grew up in the same household. But um, some parents don't like to relive the past. I'm thankful my mother wasn't afraid to do that because I grew up with a, a better perspective on things. And uh, and she's a combination of optimist and paranoid. Uh, so in 1995 uh, was the 50th anniversary of her liberation. And uh, she called me to her house and she said, well, I got the call from the society. and They're doing a, a, a reunion. Uh, I said, of the survivors? Yes, it's in uh, Belsen. I said, is this your way of telling me you'd like me to take you? To, well, back I to would Bergen go. Nelson? Yeah. She said, well, I would go. I said, okay. So I arranged a trip for my mom and my sister, my brother and myself. And uh, we flew uh, as guests of the German government to uh, this reunion of uh, Holocaust survivors from around the world. They came uh, back to Belsen and I think it was Helmut Kohl, who was the chancellor at the time, and he spoke. And, and I remember sitting there with my mom in the audience, and she was looking around, obviously. She was very quiet on that trip, and deep in thought. And she said she was very proud that she was standing there with her children. She felt for the first time that she'd actually won the war. And I thought that was such a positive statement to come from someone who had experienced so much in her life. And what was that like for you? Oh, we were all in tears, of course. It's interesting to me how Germany has dealt with its history of the Holocaust because I was recently there, mm -hmm. and I was really taken with how they don't try to erase history. No. They, they embrace their history, but say how they have moved on yeah. since. Well, but the history to, you know. is there. And right 
the street right by where Hitler used to have his rallies. The street was named for Yitzhak Rabin. Right. So on the bus, I'm seeing this, and I thought, yeah, this is the way to do it. What I didn't ask you yet was, how did your parents get reunited? Tell us that story. Uh, well, that's a, that's a good story, too. Uh, <clears throat> they got separated. Obviously, my dad was transferred out uh, to other camps, and, and uh, he ended up after liberation in Munich. And uh, after the war, uh, the people that had survived in Bergen-Belsen were moved into the officers' quarters, the barracks, and uh, because they torched the uh, the actual place where they were incarcerated, uh, but they said the excuse was uh, because of disease and typhus. But I think it was partially political; they didn't want it standing. But anyway, that's another story. Uh, anyway, she was living in the barracks, and they it was a displaced persons camp now, and they would post every day survivors, so people were trying desperately to find out which of their family members were still alive. And, and my dad had discovered my mom's brother, bumped into my mom's brother in a hospital in Munich, and he had Jesus. also survived the war. And so when they saw each other, you know, he, he my dad said, well, I, you know, I'll wait and we'll both go to Belson because I think they're there. He, he had this uh, feeling that they were there. At least one of them had survived there. So, uh, But my dad got impatient to wait, and he left. I guess by that time they were just hitchhiking around Europe trying to, to find each other. So, And my mom didn't know that he had survived, and uh, she said she was in the, uh, she was hanging something out of the window, I think clothes to be dried or something like that, and she saw him walk in to view and she fainted and she almost fell out the window of course uh, so they were reunited and they eventually got married in Belson <clears throat> at the displaced persons camp yeah uh -huh. <coughs> excuse me <coughs> you've been doing a lot of talking today um and and why did they decide to settle in Canada do you know I mean were there other uh, relatives that yeah came my to father's Canada? sister had left uh, Poland before the war and had missed the, the, uh, the Holocaust. And she was there, uh, so my father wanted to be reunited with his sister, so they decided on Canada. And, excuse me, so they came with... My mother came, her mother and her sister all and her brother all moved to, to Canada along with my dad. I can't believe everyone survived. I mean, that's just an amazing yeah. story in and of itself. Well, my dad lost both his parents and I think six brothers and sisters in the Jesus. war. Uh, I know I know there are at least two Rush songs um, that were inspired yeah, by your parents' um, experiences. Red Sector A, yeah. 1984. Mm-hmm. And also from your solo album, Grace to Grace. Yes. My question to you is, how, how did your parents' experiences and you learning about that, how did that impact you, who you became? Well, it's, it's a hard question to answer. Uh, you know, uh, obviously, I think Children of the Holocaust have uh, um, a cross to bear in a way. And people have written books. Uh, smarter people than me have written books about it. Uh, it's hard to say. My experience is I was raised in a house uh, largely by my mom. And my mom is a fighter and a survivor. And so she taught us the importance of uh, working for what you want in life and the importance of family. Uh, of course, as a teenager, I rebelled to all things familial. And uh, when I started playing music, she thought I'd run off to join the circus, pretty much. Uh, but we, you know, we that didn't last long, you know. Uh, and uh, so I don't feel like I was scarred by her experiences. I feel like I was made wiser by her experiences and help me view the world in a different way and and to fight intolerance and to fight for humanity and to, it made me um, a liberal thinker 
and I remain a liberal thinker, uh, and especially in this day that we're living in, this day and age, where uh, the word liberal is, is quickly becoming a dirty word, I think it's important to fight for those things. Uh, I wanted to also ask you what you say or what you think of people who are the Holocaust deniers. Well, they're the worst people in the world. I mean, to deny that that happened, I, it's just, it's a shame. Uh, it's a shame on humanity, you know, just like racism is a shame on humanity and, and anti Semitism is a shame on humanity. I mean, it, we live in an incredible uh, uh, universe where we are able to learn from other cultures and embrace other cultures. And any kind of thinking that denies that right is, is wrong thinking to me. And these are. Are, are people that should be shamed. That's all I can say about it. They should be shamed. They should be ashamed of themselves. I know you were bar mitzvahed. That's a mm -hmm. coming of age, really big deal in, in Jewish families. Um, and it's very serious. Uh, how do you describe yourself now as a Jew? Well, I'm, I'm a cultural Jew. I'm not a religious person. I, I'm not a believer in God. Uh, you know, witnessing what my family went through uh, to me was proof that there was no God. So uh, I've, I don't practice the faith, but I love being a Jew, and I love my family traditions, and I love our uh, sort of racial characteristics that we share, our sense of humor, our love of fatty foods. <laughs> There's some good uh, food. Yeah, so... Uh, that's what. That's what. What. That's how I look at myself. I'm a cultural Jew. And does your mom believe in God? Oh yeah, my mom is very religious. Always has been very religious. Interesting. A lot of my family is. Most of my family is, but I take a different view. I really thank you, Getty Lee, uh, one thank of the you. founders of Rush. I. This was an extraordinary conversation, an important one to have, and thank you for sharing. And thank your mom too. Please. My pleasure. Thanks for having me here. You're welcome. Yeah, I've never got what is the conspiracy with like because that's another conspiracy thing, isn't it? Holocaust denier. I've never like what's the It's another one like flat earth to me where it's like what's the um what what is it that makes them think it basically? What is it that makes people think like, and that's what amazes me with, that's why I have a kind of obsession with flat earth, and not as a believer, but as more of a, how, understanding why people think it, what's their reasoning, there must be some type of reason to why they would think that, so I'd, I'd like to know that, I wonder if, if there is actually a video of, of the reactor who's Holocaust denier, but yeah, that was mad. And that was mad. Um, that is almost like the greatest love story ever told, really. And you kind of think like that's what makes me believe it. Like there's there was things in that story that make me believe in something. Like what is the chances? his dad would just so happen to bump into his mum's brother in a hospital like what is the chances of that and and then coming back and then finding them like yeah see I do believe that there is a God and I think saying bad things because I think we have free will and with free will, humans can do great things, but can also do bad things. But to, the worst thing a god could do is to take away our free will. That's my personal take. And then sometimes you get bad people, but you get bad people, but you get people, good people, to combat the bad. Yeah, I think there's definitely a lot 
in that story that could make you believe in God as, as much as not believe. Because I do get that thing of that why would a God do that? But there's plenty of stories in the Bible where God does bad shit to people, but you can see it in the thing of that God's plan for us wasn't to make us safe. Because if you're safe your whole life, you're weak. You're a weak person. And I don't think God wanted us to be weak. And there's a story of when Moses freed the slaves. And he was wandering around the desert with them for however long, 40 years or whatever it was. And they was all started, like, they was getting attacked by snakes. So they all kind of said, listen, Moses, can you have a word with God and tell him to die? Sort these snakes out. So Moses did, and God, I think is he gave him a staff with an emblem of a snake on it and said, put that in your camp so everybody can see it. It's the, it's the last thing they see before they go to sleep, first thing they see when they wake up. And then God didn't reduce the amount of snakes, he increased the amount of snakes. Now, you could say that's a douchebaggy thing, and why would God do it? But if you have people that fear snakes, keeping them away from them isn't making them stronger. It's not making them better. It's not making them develop. You're, they're, they're staying weak and afraid. But if you get them to face, um, face that, you, they have no choice but to deal with it. And once you deal with it and become um, used to it, you are without a doubt stronger than you was when you was afraid. That's my personal take. But the story in itself, yeah, is mad. And especially like some of them camps. Some of them camps are like, well, Auschwitz. What was the other one he said? Um... I think but there was a couple of there I mean his mum was in Warsaw which is yeah another big name in the Holocaust thing of what they did in there <laughs> how lucky is his um, dad's sister how lucky is she that she yeah had moved out of Poland but that's what I mean because you can argue if there isn't a God then why did good prevail? That they were freed. And there's without a doubt, like he said himself, their experience made him wiser. And his mum telling them that experience made him wiser and um, more tolerant and all of that. So that is like, although it's a bad thing, a positive thing did come from it. It made Geddy Lee. And I do believe in that. What's the saying that um, calm, calm seas doesn't make good sailors or something like that? Is that you need to have some type of bad in your life. Because it's always the bad things in life that will improve you. It just is. It's like you can have a good life where everything just works out wonderfully for you. And then the second it doesn't, you just fall to bits. Because up until that point, you've never had to deal with anything not going your way. And you are without doubt weak. Whereas if you're someone who constantly had to deal with bad things in your life. Then you get used to. Dealing with bad things. This is, yeah. But anyway. That's the reaction. That was a good video I know. I have to say that was a good story. Um, which is yeah. It's mad that that was, happened to them. It's just like. You just can't even. I know everyone gets taught it in school now and you learn it as just it's just a part of history now. 
But I, I think that you can't really wrap your head around that level of evil. But anyway, that's the reaction. Sweet. <laughs>